Rachel Grace Newman is an art historian hailing from Toronto, Canada, with family roots in Jamaica. She specializes in the art history of the colonial Caribbean and contemporary art practices of the Caribbean and the African diaspora. She is currently the A.W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., where she is writing a book based on her dissertation which focused on the art history of the Atlantic world, examining the role of landscape as an imperialist tool in the representation of sugar plantations and the transatlantic slave trade. Her interest in colonial history has influenced her curatorial and art practice. In the spring of 2016, she curated a show called Blood in the Sugar Bowl at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford University. And together with her brother Alex, she collaborates on an art project titled In Rapture, which uses large-scale styled portraits and narrative photography to examine ancestral connections to geographic sites in a world impacted by the forced and voluntary migrations that took place under colonialism. So with that, we'll start with Rachel Newman. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to begin by thanking Nika and Kate for the invitation to participate in this really amazing conference and thank the Courtauld for hosting us all here today. In the past few months, my research has taken me in a slightly different turn than I expected. And given that I'm presenting to a room of experts, I wanted to share some of this new research with you. In light of this, a uh, more apt title for my talk would really be reframing the plantation and the plantocracy. Because today, I want to talk to you about a different kind of plantocracy and a different kind of plantation imagery than we're used to. In the minutes that follow, you're going to see how, despite their worlds being broken, ruptured by the unforgiving institution of slavery, the people who I will tell you about try to make sense of the effects of those ruptures. To be very clear, these people were certainly not among the worst affected by slavery. In fact, they occupied an incredibly privileged position in that world. Yet, as you will see, even they were not immune to its effects. And I want to begin with a quote. Um, oh, sorry. OK, great. Um, so this is from Toni Morrison. From a woman's point of view, in terms of confronting the problems of where the world is now, black women have had to deal with postmodern problems in the 19th century and earlier. Certain kinds of dissolution, the loss of and need to reconstruct certain kinds of stability. These strategies for survival made a truly modern person. Their response to predatory Western phenomena, you can call it ideology, an economy, what it is is a pathology. Slavery broke the world in half, it broke it in every way. It broke Europe, it made them into something else, it made them slave masters, it made them crazy. They have had to reconstruct everything in order to make that system appear true. And I want you to think of that last sentence, especially as we're looking at these images of plantations. Perhaps the best place to begin is with the story of a woman named Frances Brown. Born into slavery in the late 18th century, she was raised on Belmont Plantation in rural Jamaica, a place that can be found at the termination of World's End Gully. So we're looking, I'll show you. Oh, so it's right at the top of the head of this river here that we're going to zoom in. So as you can see, this is the satellite view. And then underneath, here's Belmont at the end of World's End Gully. At some point, Frances was likely coerced into a relationship with John Shand, the wealthy Scottish owner of Belmont and manager of several other large plantations on the island. At some point, John freed Frances, even as most of her extended family remained enslaved on Belmont. 
Over the course of the next two decades, Francis would bear John 10 children, all born and baptized in St. Catherine, Jamaica. Sadly, as a woman of color, born into slavery and freed by her partner, Frances' control over her family uh, that she had built was limited. In 1816, only one year after the birth of her last child, John Shand informed her that he would be taking all of the children to the massive estate he had purchased in Scotland and that Frances would not be joining them. This is the estate as it is now. This is what it looked like in the early 1900s. As a formerly enslaved woman of color, there would be no place for her in Scotland. Besides which, her presence there would only serve as an indicator of something that would be better concealed, that the children were not only illegitimate, they were not white. Frances would stay in a house in Spanish Town, Jamaica, until her death in the mid-19th century. As far as we know, none of her children ever returned. Before her family left, however, Frances made a specific request of John. She had him commission portraits of each of her children, which she then bequeathed to them upon her death. We don't know who painted these portraits or even whether they still exist. Their production, however, stands as an incredible intervention by a woman of color to, in Morrison's words, reconstruct stability in her own fractured world. Further, they exist as a counter-narrative to more popular contemporary depictions of mixed race families like this 1808 cartoon by William Holland entitled Johnny Newcomb in Love in the West Indies that depicts a crude caricature belying the deep anxieties that existed around racial mixing. These anxieties were, by the turn of the 19th century, firmly founded in the deepest source of fear for the capitalist colonizer. That is, they were financial in nature. By this point, Jamaica's assembly had passed laws restricting the amount that mixed race children of planters could inherit, as many back in the metropole began to see their control of the island slipping into the hands of this new plantocracy. By 1816, facing limited opportunities and access to education, it is likely that thousands of these children made, their vo made the voyage across the Atlantic, achieving relative success in Britain despite their racial status. As Daniel Livesey writes in his recently published book, Children of Uncertain Fortune, the presence of these children in England and Scotland would play a vital role in influencing ideas around race, slavery, and eventually abolition. Although I am not personally aware of any account of a woman of color participating in the commission of a work like this um, in Jamaica pri or after, sorry, prior to this date, we can safely assume that works like these portraits that Francis commissioned really weren't unique. As the 18th century came to a close, more and more men and women of color became part of the plantocracy, gaining access to a means to commission works like this. I would add that this included not only women of African ancestry, but also several of Jewish ancestry. Ultimately, this story makes the point that there were complex networks of patronage functioning in Jamaica that existed outside of the groups that spring to mind when we typically think plantocracy. Although we might not have the amount of archival evidence linked to them and their involvement in the art world, we cannot discount their presence. As Saidia Hartman, who has so beautifully explored the history of the world created by the slave trade writes, quote, the irreparable violence of the Atlantic slave trade resides precisely in the stories that we cannot know and that will never be recovered. To this, she adds that there are, quote, boundaries of the archive. History pledges to be faithful to the limits of fact, evidence, and archive, even as those dead certainties are produced by terror, end quote. When we think of the plantocracy and the plantation, this is the first sort of thing that comes to mind. It's the table of contents from James Hakewell's 1821 serial publication, A Picturesque Tour of the Island of Jamaica, from Dawkins, who's listed here, whose fortune let him discover and bankroll the excavation of Palmyra, Syria, to Beckford, who at the age of 10 inherited a fortune of approximately 130 million pounds, 
was at one point the richest commoner in, in uh, England. It reads like a veritable who's who of planters. Many of them owned multiple plantations in the Caribbean and many would never see those holdings as they did not want to take the risks of traveling to Jamaica or living in Jamaica. The images seen in Hakewell's work and indeed the most predominant type of plantation imagery that we know were designed for and sponsored by this kind of viewer, this kind of plantocracy. Hakewell's depiction of Williams Field Estate is perfectly in line with how they would have wanted to see their plantations depicted. The 800 enslaved people who lived on this plantation are virtually erased in Hakewell's visual imagination. And when they do appear, they are so small, they are barely visible. In one image after another, sumptuous plantation homes perch amidst lush Jamaican geography, while lone slaves lounge in the hills, never toiling, simply existing under the firm but, quote, fatherly care of their masters. The brutality of the system that they picture is not the only thing that has been obscured in these images. Hakewell created an idealized depiction of an economic system in peril. After 1800, the frequency of slave revolts rose dramatically, and between 1815 and 1833, Jamaican sugar production declined by nearly one-sixth as bankruptcies ran rampant in the Caribbean. Utilizing compositional schemes familiar to a metropolitan audience, artists like Hake will render the foreign space legible to the European viewer by using a visual language they were familiar with. As Jill Cassid points out in her book, Sewing Empire, the picturesque was a process of recognition that meant translating terrain into an established compositional type. The reformations enacted by the picturesque in these prints were played out in reality on plantations where violent re-landscaping of the islands enabled the growth of non-native plants like sugarcane. In my dissertation, I argue that the picturesque Images like this one, with their roots in an emphasis on the pastoral, diminish the modern industrial nature of the plantation. And they were constructed through a pastiche of observed real and imagined ideal nature. So the picturesque effectively took place out of real time, a feature of the genre that undermined the careful attention to time on plantations where time was obsessively monitored and structured. Ultimately, these images extract these ultra-modern industrial spaces, spaces that in many ways ushered in the modern era as we know it from the narrative of modernity, placing them outside of time and history. The persistence of this kind of imagery into the early 20th century through tourist photography has continued to entrench these spaces in the skewed telling of history. Although he arrived in Jamaica several years before Hakewell, <coughs> William Berryman adapted an entirely distinct approach to depicting the space of the plantation and Jamaica in general. A woodblock printmaker and watercolorist based in London, in 1808, he traveled to Jamaica to accompany his sister to marry William Sells, a doctor who worked on the Four Paths Plantation in Clarendon Parish. Berryman would remain in Jamaica for another eight years, during which time he produced over 300 drawings and watercolors. During his time on the island, Berryman traveled extensively staying with various families and repaying them for their hospitality by producing miniature portraits of them and likely views around their properties. And this is, uh, I have started mapping everywhere that he went in Jamaica, but um, I'm by no means finished. Um, although you can see where his travels are concentrated are in these very sugar rich parishes. Um, <laughs> Unlike the contemporary depictions of the island, most of his landscapes are composed of these broad horizontal bands with low horizon lines, and many were created on the spot, containing detailed notes of place, time, sky coloration, and cloud formation. You can see his notes in the bottom of the image. This concern with accurate time and its impact on the environment in Jamaica acknowledges the existence of that place and the plantation in the present moment, not in a sort of imagined distant past. 
Further, Berryman often foregrounds people of African descent in his images, not marginalizing them like his contemporaries. And these are just a few examples of his work in which he is really foregrounding um, people of African descent in a way that we don't really see in other, other images from the time. This unique approach to the plantation landscape can be seen in this view of Edward Beeston Long's Lucky Valley Plantation. The composition of the image ensures that we are enveloped by the Jamaican landscape, a trope that constantly appears in Berryman's work. In this scene, broad leaves of plantain and banana trees crowd the foreground. Berryman's careful attention to these trees communicates a great deal about his interaction with the landscape around him and the way that he wanted others to see Jamaica. In differentiating them from their surroundings, Berryman refuted the commonly held idea that outside of the cultivated rows of sugarcane, Jamaica was simply an overgrown wilderness. The presence of the plantain trees suggests that this hillside was cultivated, not as part of the industrial agriculture of the plantation, but as the provision grounds. Throughout Berryman's of, we repeatedly encounter this space, which was not part of the industrial complex, but was intended for the internal island economy. In using this to frame his image of Lucky Valley, Berryman addressed aspects of plantation life that would be unknown to a foreign or absentee planter audience. Although the hillside may look overgrown and wild, any local would recognize the presence of those non-domestic trees just as carefully cultivated as the fields of sugar cane that lie beyond. And that these are the sugar cane fields up on the hills here. And through this uh, survey, we can actually see where Berryman was sitting. Um, so he was uh, likely on this side of the river, looking across, and the main part of the plantation would have been here, and then those hills of sugarcane are rising up that were behind are here. Okay. Often separated <clears throat> by miles from the Great House Sugar Works and Slave Village and the open sugarcane fields, the provision ground, also known as the Plantain Walk, was typically hidden away in a densely cor wooded corner of the estate on mountainous terrain ill-suited for growing sugar. Here, enslaved people worked independently, unsupervised by any overseer or driver. While the land of the plant provision ground belonged to the estate owner, the right to cultivate it belonged to the enslaved. It was, to use Henri Lefebvre's terminology, a space of appropriation. Dominated as opposed to appropriated space is space transformed by technology and the realization of the master's project. Appropriated, on the other hand, is space that has been inhabited by a group or individual possessed through practices that reshape, modify, or adjust the space to their uses. Though seemingly innocuous, these plots of land actually posed a great threat to planter control. And I'll just go through a few more images of that Berryman produces of this space of the plant and walk, um, which he's returns to over and over and over again. So these plots of land actually posed a great threat to planter control, but were necessary for the maintenance of a healthy workforce, especially in the years after the abolition of the slave trade. Because of their work on these so-called ruinette plots of land that often combined West African and indigenous Caribbean gardening practices, so these are vertical gardens as opposed to horizontal gardens. By the late 18th century, enslaved people actually had a virtual monopoly on the island's internal market system. And by 1832, almost a third of Jamaica's total agricultural output came from these provision grounds. What this ultimately meant was that the provision ground and subsequent sale of its produce at market not only prepared slaves for freedom, but in thousands of cases actually gave many the opportunity to live as freed men. Um, and in fact, during this period that Berryman's producing this work, the free colored black population of Jamaica quadruples from 10,000 to 46,000 people. <clears throat> 
Thus, in his view of one of these largest plantations of the island, Berryman actually chooses to foreground this alternative space of production, a space that served to destabilize the socioeconomic dominance of the planter elite. In the words of the great Jamaican thinker Sylvia Winter, quote, the plot was the slave's area of escape from the plantation. It was an area of experience which reinvented and therefore perpetuated an alternative worldview, alternative consciousness to that of the plantation. This worldview was marginalized by the plantation but never destroyed." End quote. To add to this, Catherine Youssef in her recent book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, adds, quote, the relation of the slave to provision ground was a relation contingent to earth, a material relation forged in resistance to the dehumanizing of colonialism that opened a carceral geography." End quote. Indeed, as you drive through the countryside of Jamaica today, these are the kind of gardens that you see attached to most homes, the necessary knowledge of the past persisting into the present. These are just a few more images that he produces of this space. Okay. To conclude, I want to return to what, in the absence of an archive, I imagine the portraits of Francis children might have looked like. This portrait, which I've written about extensively elsewhere, is, I believe, of Jemima Lee Clare, the daughter of Jemima Johnson Lee. The elder Jemima was the daughter of William Lee, a British surgeon of the Spanish town jail, and the black woman who he described in his will as his faithful lifelong companion, Eliza Gardner Johnson. Upon William's death, Jemima, his only child, inherited all of his plantations and his slaves. She would have two children by two different doctors, both of her father's business partners, and like Francis, Francis' children, all of the, them would eventually be sent to Scotland to be educated. I believe this portrait was produced by Berryman uh, during his return voyage to England. On June 15th, his transatlantic journey finally came to a close as he sailed along the south coast of England, passing the small town of Hythe on his way to the mouth of the Thames, which would bring him back to London. And I'll just zoom out here so that you can see the other image that's on this, and for your convenience. Um, so the boat heading into Hythe, and these are the cliffs of the south coast of England here. This is the boat, um, has been combined with this image of Jemmy. And I'm really happy to speak more about that image. Um, but upon his return, Berryman would become involved in the development of a school for the children of the families he met in Jamaica. I believe that Jemima was destined for that school and that is why she traveled back with Berryman and his sister. Fixed both geographically and ancestrally between colony and metropole, Jemmy embodies modernity in so many ways. Her journey, reversing the forced migration and willful immigration of her ancestors, ushered in a new era for the Atlantic world as the legacies of the slave trade took on a new form and the children came home. Indeed, that legacy is resurrected in this room. Sorry. Today, as one of Berryman's descendants actually sits among us. I like to think of her ancestors and mine who worked on the plantations near to where Frances Brown was born and where Berryman traveled, coexisting, never realizing that 200 years later we would meet. Yet here we are tying off those loose cords of history, repairing the ruptures as we proceed into the future. Thank you.